92% of households that start the year with Peloton are still active a year later. 92% because of a bike? Not just bikes. We also make treadmills and rowers. Oh, let me guess, for elite athletes only, right? Nope. It doesn't matter if you're an avid exerciser or new to working out. Peloton can help you achieve your fitness goals. 92% stick with it. So can you. Try Peloton bikes, tread or row, risk-free with a 30-day home trial. New members only. Not available in remote locations. See additional terms at onepeloton.com slash home dash trial. Revived Thoughts is a production of Revive Studios. This is Troy and Joel, and this is Revive Thoughts. What a glorious order. He first establishes a beginning so that it might not be supposed that the world never had a beginning. Every episode, we bring you a different voice from history and a sermon that they deliver today. We're going to listen to a sermon from Basil going back to the 4th century in Caesarea. Basil, Basil. Sometimes I say Basil. I apologize in advance. It it looks like Basil. It does. I I, I think of Basil every time I use Basil now. Mm. And this has been a three-year problem. You're calling Basil Uh, Basil now. Yeah, exactly. So now it's all Basil to me. Boy, what a great way to start the episode, especially if you're new. Joel, I'm glad you're on with us, unlike you were a few weeks ago. So if you're listening, we appreciate you. And this is, we are very serious, you know, church uh, historians, you know, not professionally or in any way, but we, we know we enjoy this. We had a sermon by Basil called To the Rich, which came out about three years ago. And of all the sermons that we put out, This was the one that when it went out, I always remember this. We received multiples of emails that week saying, oh, well, that was really convicting. Thank you. And it was a sermon he delivered on how to use your money. And I'll never forget that there was a line in there where he said, do you want to know who the most generous donor at this church is? It's death because you people only give up money in your wills. And it was like, whoa, man. What a what a great burn! Um, it's a great line. A great line. It always stuck with me. It's just like yikes. Could you imagine if you got to church on Sunday and your pastor said that about you? I mean, wow, that's just uh, brutal. And so I've always it, we heard a lot of people say that was a really convicting sermon because he just basically laid it out there like you don't use your money the way you should. Uh, now we're back three years later. Basil going back through him. He has this interesting sermon that I wanted to t- tackle and listen to. Uh, here in a few minutes. But first, Joel, give us a little refresher on who he yeah, is. Yeah, born in 329 AD. He not not preaching in BC before Christ? No. Yeah, that wouldn't, that'd be, that'd be hard to fit into the church history format here. But uh, <laughs> in what is modern day Turkey, so I say 329 AD because it, it, it sounds strange just leaving it as a three digit number because so much of the dates we reference are 1928, four syllables long. Yeah, that's and true. And so 329, 329, it's only three syllables. So I feel like they need to, there needs to be more <laughs> syllables to make it more uh, auditorially pleasing. Three, 329 go. AD in, in what was modern day Turkey, grew up in, in a very important city. Caesarea was uh, one of the military and commercial centers of the Roman Empire and really the world at this time. But this is an interesting era in Roman history, in world history in general, because uh, Rome had just recently shifted its national religion over to Christianity after being pagan for a very long time. It was getting mixed up here, and people like Basil, uh, who had been firm in the faith and who has family lineage that had also been firm in the faith, these people are now seen like heroes, right? These are people that, now now that everyone else is saying, oh, I guess we're all Christian now, look at this Basil guy that has been living the life, Uh, him and his family have been on this Christian path for uh, generations before us. What does he have to say? He's he's already a pro at this Christian thing. These people were genuine. Like the Basil and his family, his uncle was also a bishop at the time. These were people who took their faith very seriously. It was common back in those early days. And we always do kind of try to remind you when we're going to one of these early sermons that it's been 1,700 years. So if their life sounds a little different to you or maybe their preaching style is a little different, I uh, do recall it's been a very long time. They're living in the same Roman Empire, under the same empire that crucified Christ. And so it's just, imagine how different their life is. 
Back in those days, it was common for aristocrats to be sent kind of all over as you're growing up for education. The more cities and people you studied under, kind of the bigger your resume was. So, you know, for us, we might say, oh, I, I studied at Cambridge or, you know, you know, Oxford or Harvard or something like that, right? For them, it'd be like, oh, yeah, I, you know, I grew up in New York City, but then I tutored over in Los Angeles. And then I also had a, had a, a you know, an education stint in Dallas. You're, you're just trying to build up a, a bunch of names and cities and places. And he was sent to Constantinople first. And then eventually educated in Athens. Athens was kind of the cream of the crop for education back then. Um, it was the Harvard, you know, the best you could get under. And while in Athens, he became friends with Gregory of Nazianzus, who would become a theologian and would be a close friend of his and would walk, you know, would be a part of his story for a long time. And we have covered, of course, Gregory of Nazianzus before. Go find that episode. Listen to it. He's a great guy, too. Now, while in Athens, he started to think of kind of joining the church and going in that direction, but he wasn't sure. So he started out a secular career, just a teacher kind of job. However, his sister, Macarena, convinced him to go to church. She was dedicated, devout, faithful, just really serious about her faith. She would eventually become a nun herself. And her commitment and constant talk of God just convinced all the siblings that they should go into ministry as well. They, she just laid it all out there that the most important thing is God. Why are you living for anything else? Basil then went, went on to become a bishop. Uh, and things would have stayed pretty simple. Uh, but his sister told him about this new idea of asceticism. This was a new way of kind of being in ministry and doing things that was gripping the early church during this time. And he decided to go to Egypt and Syria and kind of see what that whole life was about. Yeah, so he went out and he observed these ascetics for a while. And he wrote down his thoughts on it. He says, quote, I was amazed at the way of life of the ascetics. I marveled at their willingness to suffer, how fervent they were in prayer, how sparing in sleep and in no way admitting the needs of the body, always keeping to the highest purpose and preserving the goal of the soul in hunger and in thirst, cold and nakedness, not bothered with the body, not even giving it the slightest care, but living as if they had no part with things of the flesh. They showed by deed what it means to sojourn here below, but to have citizenship in heaven. And so you can see the uh, the foundation of what would eventually become this this monastery, this monk movement here. These people that uh, really tried to separate themselves from the desires of the flesh, and this made a huge impact on Basil. From that point on, he decided to to follow the same lifestyle, but with some changes. He learned from people in Armenia at the time. He sold all that he had, and he joined. Uh, and he had several friends that joined him to live in, again, this kind of proto-monastery that he's setting up here. His brothers joined him, his younger brother, who would be remembered as Peter of Sebast. Of course, Gregory of Nazianzus was there as well, and also his younger brother, Gregory of Nyssa. The two Gregories and Basil would, would go down in history as the Cappadocian fathers, and we've covered them as well in, uh, in previous episodes. It's often thought that the Council of Nicaea, Arianism, was defeated. And from that point onward, the Roman Empire was Christian. I've even seen some people say Constantine kind of ruined Christianity because he merged uh, the Christianity with Rome and it created a cultural Christianity that was very damaging. One of the big problems I've seen with this theory, though, is that the Council of Nicaea did not end Arianism. In fact, it doesn't seem to go away. And the more you study the 4th century, the more you realize Arianism is a constant threat against Christianity, trying to take control of what Christianity had at the time, Nicene Christianity. And we talk in a recent episode about Ambrose's siege caused by an Arian emperor trying to take you know the power. And in this episode, we see something very similar happening about 28 years before that event. It starts with Constantius II. He uh, was an Arian, and in, in 359, he tried to bring Arianism back into power, even kind of undo what happened at the pro-Nicene Council. And even though most of the people who went to it were pro-Nicene, let's keep the Nicene Creed and all that stuff, somehow the few Arians there were kind of able to reword things. And by the time it got to the emperor, it said basically Arianism is the Christianity for us. And he signed it really quickly. Well, all the Christian bishops in the land said, wait, hold up. That's not what we agree to. You guys have done some shenanigans. And so in 360, they hold another council. Basil will go to this council and he will make speeches and rally people and say, we've got to stop Arianism. Uh, this is a real threat to our faith. And you may be hearing all this and wondering, well, what, you know, what does this matter to me now? But I think it's oftentimes when the state and church, you know, can work together, it can be used against the church. And there can often be times where attempts will be made to water down the faith. 
And I also think it's interesting how much there was this real battle between people saying they were Christians just like you and me, and yet in reality, they believed in a very different God, and yet they looked so similar. And for people watching, it was very difficult. And it was only the ministers who stood for truth and stood the test of time and continued to rally and fight this cause was the difference between these two groups able to be seen more clearly. We know it pretty well today, which group was correct and was biblical and which group wasn't. But at the time, it was quite the intense debate. And if you were a Roman citizen, you wouldn't have a hard time picking out which one was right. And and you, you would have to be taught. And I think we see that a lot today, too, where there's still issues that the church is up against. And uh, it can be sometimes hard and murky. And then, yeah, I think history kind of clarifies and you go, oh, that one group seemed to be the one that was following God. The next emperor was called Julian the Apostate, and he tried to drag the empire back into paganism, and Basil fought hard against this, as as all the church did at that time. And one of the things that made Basil particularly successful and also made him a big target during this time was his involvement with charity, giving to the poor and to the needy. At this time, you know, like your nonprofit charities or NGOs, they were not a, a, they were not a thing, right? So it was the job of the church to care for the poor, for the widows, for the orphans. Julian the Apostate himself complained that Christian charity was the greatest obstacle to returning to paganism. Basil ran orphanages and hospitals and a place for the staff to stay and live at the facilities so they could be cared for as well. On top of that, they took special care of lepers, which uh, at the time was unheard of. Like, that's not something you did. Lepers were cast outs, right? So the fact that they were taking care of them really, really set it apart. It was a change in history there. The next emperor after Julian the Apostate uh, was a, a guy called Valens, Emperor Valens, who was also Arian, and he tried to get Basil's church shut down. But Basil was able to reunite the factions of the city and hold off the, uh, the the political changes and preserve uh, his church. Valens decided to be friendlier to Nicene Christians as he realized he was getting a lot of pushback during this era of trying to kind of promote Arianism with a kind of a heavy hand. Uh, but at one point he was traveling through the empire, kind of going around, and a leader was sent to talk to Basil and was kind of like, hey, can we come, on, can we come up with a compromise between Arianism and Nicene Christianity? Certainly there's something we can do and we don't have to fight on this forever. Basil offended the royal court by directly saying, no, like I'm not going to meet for a compromise. I have no interest in even discussing the matter of compromise with you. I won't go to a meeting about a discussion of this. And the diplomat was shocked. And he said, no one has ever talked to me like this before. Don't you know who I represent kind of thing? And Basil said, well, maybe you've never met a Christian minister before, which is just, oof, right? Like that's just a wow. Uh, they just two had two big fights over politics and they went off back and forth, emperor violence versus Basil, the bishop. But over time, things got better. And one of the reasons for that was Valens went to uh, see ba Basil preach personally, kind of went and checked it out. And despite being an Arian, he was moved by the preaching and he really was moved by all the work that Basil did for the poor. It was, again, no denying, Julian the Apostate said it, the charity is the thing that makes the Christians hardest to stop. And Valens seemed to be moved by just the amount of effort put into that. A few years earlier, a terrible famine had hit the area, and Basil had helped convince the rich to grow farms, get food, keep the poor alive, kind of almost design what we would almost look like today, like a soup kitchen. And he taught that something that people really didn't know before, disasters were not divine punishments from God for their sins, but were actually opportunities to share Christ to the hurting. And that when they're a disaster, the Christians should rush in and kind of fix whatever's wrong and use that time to preach Christ. This was a real change in perspective, and all of this affected uh, the the people and affected Valens too. Saw all this and was like, "Oh wow, I'm I'm really impressed with this." He not only kind of he laid the heat off a little bit off of Basil, but he also donated some land to help Basil in his effort. He sent uh, later on Basil on like a diplomatic mission to Armenia, but before it was really all over, Basil uh, would pass on uh, only at the age of fifty. A man who would convert his enemies even to somewhat be supporters of his. Uh, he did it through his words, which were very powerful, great preacher. He did it through his actions, standing firm and not backing down, even willing to offend the royal court. And he did it through his courage, uh, just willing to stand up for whatever was true, no matter what. And all of that while taking care of the poor and doing the things God has called him to do and rejecting his wealthy background. Listen to a sermon by such a passionate man called In the Beginning. It 
is right that anyone beginning to narrate the formation of the world should begin with the good order which reigns in visible things. I'm about to speak of the creation of heaven and earth, which was not spontaneous, as some have imagined, but drew its origin from God. Who has ears worthy to hear such a story? How earnestly the soul should prepare itself to receive such high lessons! How pure it should be from carnal affections! How unclouded by worldly distractions! How active and passionate in its search for truth! And how eager to find in its surroundings an idea of God which may be worthy of him. But before weighing the justice of these remarks, before examining all the senses contained in these few words, let us see who addresses them to us. Because if the weakness of our intelligence does not allow us to understand the depths of what the writer is saying to us, then let us be forcibly drawn to faith in his words by the force of the authority of he who is speaking. Now it is Moses who has composed this history, the Moses that the daughter of Pharaoh adopted, who received from her a royal education, and who had for his teachers the wise men of Egypt, Moses who disdained the pomp of royalty, and to share the humble condition of his compatriots, preferred to be persecuted with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting delights of sin. Moses, who received from nature such a love of justice that even before the leadership of the people of God was committed to him, he was impelled by a natural horror of evil to pursue abusers, even to the point of punishing them by death. Moses, who banished by those who had taken care of him, he had been hurried to escape from the chaos of Egypt and took refuge in Ethiopia. Living there far from former pursuits and passing 40 years in the contemplation of nature, Moses finally, who at the age of 80, saw God as far as it is possible for man to see him. According to the testimony of God himself, if there is a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make myself known to him in a vision and will speak to him in a dream. My servant Moses is not like this, and who is faithful in all my house with him will I speak mouth to mouth, even clearly, and not in dark speeches. Numbers chapter 12, verses 6 to 8. It is this man whom God judged worthy to behold him face to face like the angels who imparts to us what he has learned from God. Let us listen, then, to these words of truth written without the help of the enticing words of man's wisdom, 1 Corinthians 2, 4, by the dictation of the Holy Spirit, words destined not to produce the applause of those who hear them, but the salvation of those who are instructed by them. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1, 1. I stop here, struck with the admiration at this thought. What can I say first? Where do I begin my story? Will I show the vanity of the Gentiles? Do I exalt the truth of our faith? The philosophers of Greece have made much effort to explain nature, and not one of their systems has remained firm and unshaken. Each is overturned by its successor. It is worthless to refute them. They sufficiently do it themselves and eventually destroy one another. Those who were too ignorant to rise to a knowledge of a God could not allow that an intelligent cause presided at the birth of the universe. It is a primary error that leaves them sad consequences. Some went to material principles and attributed the origin of the universe to the elements of the world. Others imagined that atoms and invisible bodies, molecules and sand form by their union the nature of the visible world. Atoms reuniting or separating produce births and deaths, and the most durable bodies only owe their consistency to the strength of their mutual adhesion. A true spider's web of confusion woven by these writers who give to heaven, to earth, and to sea so weak an origin with so little consistency. It is because they did not know how to say, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Deceived by their inherent atheism, 
It appeared to them that nothing governed or ruled the universe, and that all was given up to chance. To guard us against this error, the writer of the creation from the very first words enlightens our understanding with the name of God. In the beginning, God created. What a glorious order. He first establishes a beginning so that it might not be supposed that the world never had a beginning. Then he adds created to show that which was made was a very small part of the power of the creator. In the same way that the potter, after having made with equal pains a great number of vessels, has not exhausted either his art or his talent. And so the maker of the universe, whose creative power, far from being bounded by one world, could extend to the infinite. He needed only the impulse of his will to bring the immensities of the visible world into being. If the world has a beginning and it has been created, Ask who gave it this beginning. Who was the creator? Perhaps in the fear that human reasonings may make you wander from the truth, Moses has anticipated this question by engraving in our hearts as a seal and a safeguard the serious name of God. In the beginning, God created. It is he, benevolent nature, goodness without measure, a worthy object of love for all beings endowed with reason, the beauty most to be desired, the origin of all that exists, the source of life, intellectual light, impenetrable wisdom. It is he who in the beginning created heaven and earth. Do not then go to imaginations, O man. Don't believe that the visible world is without a beginning. And because the celestial bodies move in a circular course, it is difficult for our senses to define the point where the circle begins. So do not believe that bodies compelled by a circular movement are from their nature without a beginning. Without a doubt, the circle, I mean the course that the celestial bodies move on, is beyond our perception, and it is impossible for us to find out where it begins or where it ends. But we should not, because of this, believe it is without a beginning. So do not vainly imagine to yourselves that the world has neither beginning nor end. For the fashion of this world passes away. 1 Corinthians 7, 31. And heaven and earth will also pass away. Matthew chapter 24, verse 35. The dogmas of the end and of the renewing of the world are announced beforehand in these short words put at the head of the inspired history. In the beginning, God made. That which was begun in time is condemned to come to an end in time. If there has been a beginning, do not doubt the end. Of what use, then, are geometry, the calculations of arithmetic, the study of solids, and far-famed astronomy? This never-ending vanity, if those who pursue them imagine that this visible world is co-eternal with the creator of all things, with God himself. If they attribute to this limited world, which has a material body, the same glory as to the incomprehensible and invisible nature, how do they not imagine that the universe will end when they can see that the parts that make it up often come to an end? But they have become vain in their imaginations, and their foolish hearts have darkened, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Romans chapter 1, verses 21 and 22. Some have affirmed that heaven coexists with God from all eternity. Others that it is God himself without beginning or end and the cause of the particular arrangement of all things. One day, certainly, their terrible condemnation will be greater for all this worldly wisdom they had. For seeing so clearly into vain sciences, they have willfully shut their eyes to the knowledge of the truth. These men who measure the distances of the stars and describe them, both those of the north always shining brilliantly in our view and those of the southern pole visible to the inhabitants of the south but unknown to us, those who divide the northern zone and the circle of the zodiac into an infinity of parts, who observe with exactitude the course of the stars, their fixed places, their descents, their return, and the time that each takes to make its revolution. For these men, I say, have discovered all except for one thing, the fact that God is the creator of the universe and the just judge who rewards all the actions of life according to their merit. 
They have not known how to bring themselves to the idea of the creator of all things, the consequence of the doctrine of judgment, and to see that the world must change if souls pass from this life to a new life. In reality, as the nature of the present life presents affection to this world, so in the future life our souls will enjoy an existence matching their new condition. But they are so far from applying these truths that they only laugh when we announce to them the end of all things and regeneration of the age. Do not let us attempt to follow them for fear of falling into similar vanities. Let them refute each other, and without distraction ourselves about essence, let us say with Moses, God created the heavens and the earth. Let us glorify the supreme architect for all that was wisely and skillfully made, By the beauty of visible things, let us raise ourselves to him who is above all beauty. By the grandeur of bodies, sensible and limited in their nature, let us conceive of the infinite being whose immensity and omnipotence surpass all the efforts of the imagination. Because although we ignore the nature of created things, the objects which on all sides attract our notice are so marvelous that the most penetrating mind cannot attain to the knowledge of the least of the movements of the world, either to give a suitable explanation of it or to render the proper duty of praise to the Creator for it. For the Creator is to whom belongs all glory, all honor, and all power without end. Now since the beginning naturally comes before that which follows it, the writer out of necessity when speaking to us of things which had their origin in time, put at the head of his narrative these words, In the beginning, God created. Amen. I thought this sermon was very interesting in the beginning, because if you pay attention Some of the same fights that we are having today, they were having back then. How did all of this happen? And where does our creator come from? And where where do we find our beginning? And yet Basil is saying right here in the sermon, it's in Genesis. And we find that God created this world and that through him, we can know our creator. And that is where it begins. It just was so interesting for me to see that one of the places, the faith of God and people, Christians are often attacked is our belief in the creator and our belief that these, you know, this world around us was created, not random, not by chance, but actually ordered and designed by a perfect God. And when you go back 1700 years ago, if you'd gone to church, Basil would be saying basically the same thing. Like, yeah, they don't believe that this was created. They don't believe that time had a start, but they're wrong. God did it in the beginning. And I thought that was just really cool. And I enjoyed just seeing that connection to our, uh, it's, it's, it's something that's been around for a long time. And yet we can have our firm faith and the God who created all of us. Today's sermon was narrated by Keith Foskey. If you have not heard of Foskey, Keith Foskey has been the pastor of Sovereign Grace Family Church in Jacksonville, Florida since January 2006. He is a graduate of Ashford University and Jacksonville Baptist Theological Seminary. He is the host of Conversations with the Calvinist, a weekly look at scripture, culture, and media from a Reformed perspective. He and his wife, Jennifer, have six children. If you have heard of Keith Foskey, a little bit of an update on his biography since the first time he did a sermon with us. He also does lots of funny videos about church denominations getting together. You can find them on Twitter or Facebook or maybe YouTube, uh, or, or I think he's even on TikTok as well. But go check out his stuff. He has lots of really humorous content, and he himself is a very nice person and had me on his show, Conversations with the Calvinist, to talk about church history uh, a little bit less than a year ago. So a really great guy. Go check out his content and definitely go um, watch some of his videos. They're really good. If you liked uh, today's sermon, tell a friend. Tell, uh, tell a buddy of it. It's, it's the best way we can grow our show. It's the best way to ensure the future of the show is uh, is to have it uh, be listened to and liked by by many people. So uh, post it or, or share it with a buddy. Uh, you can find it on any podcast app of choice. Thank you so much. This is Troy and Joel, and this is Revive Thoughts. <laughs>